following program is available in high definition on channel 700. This program is designed and produced by the community with the support of TV Kojiko. Hello, welcome to Oakville Matters. This is the local cable television show on Channel 23 and glorious high definition on Channel 700 where we look at the things that matter to Oakville. And today, one of the things that matters the most to Oakville is change in our neighborhoods. And change in our neighborhoods is meant to be controlled and, and uh, only very carefully done under the terms of our official plan and it's uh, groundbreaking section 11 that seeks to preserve our established neighborhoods. And under council's scheme of things, uh, we have a committee of adjustment to allow people what are called minor variances uh, in order to deal with, in order to show consideration to people who have uh, unusual lots and they need a tweak here and there from what the zoning says. But over the years, this, this has grown to be an area of great concern to council and the public because we're seeing changes in some of our uh, older, more established neighborhoods that we were not anticipating. With us today to talk about this very live issue and what we can do about it are Janet Hazlitt Thiel, who's the leader of the Joshua Creek Residents Association, Linda Morgan, who's a uh, change management expert and a uh, activist in the Ward 2 area where a lot of this is going on, and Shelley Thornborough, who's the vice president of the Brawny Village Residents Association. And Brawny Village Residents Association is a very unique residents association in that it is the largest sort of territory covered by any residents association I can think of. You have the greatest variety of housing forms, and, and you cover all kinds of new and established stable neighborhoods. Shelley, let's we'll start with you. Have you seen uh, uh, concern about the Committee of Adjustment and minor variances that don't look minor? Uh, in your area, which is all pretty much all of Ward 1. We have, and but a lot of the concerns go beyond just what, what is defined as minor variances. Um, it goes into site applications as well, because as you know, we're dealing with a site application right in the Bronte Village core. Um, the thrust of a lot of the issues that we're getting from our residents and members is about the public notification and being able to participate in the process and understand when these uh, these hearings are coming up and understanding the documentation behind it and being able to have an opportunity to put ideas forward on whether they support or oppose to the application. Um, the other facet that seems to be coming up in terms of conversation is once an application goes forward and, and construction is underway, it tends to be very prolonged. There is not a lot of bylaw enforcement. We've had a lot of issues about the, the timing of construction within the in the residents in the area and a lot of their complaints not being able to be followed up with the town so um, we've gone through a period where there was a lot of applications a lot of construction and it's still ongoing because it is an, an older neighborhood and there's a lot of attrition happening but I think most of that is seeming to cascade now into War II. Um, so we're, we're coming out of a huge brunt of it, but we're still seeing it in sections. Ah, now I know, Linda, in your area, in the center of, uh, especially in the center of War II, mm -hmm. when I drive through there, it seems like every street has one or two rebuilds or renovations going on. Yes. And the, the disruption from all of that construction has got to be getting to people. Is that what's, what, what started you on this issue? Uh, well, what actually started me is, is not only the uh, pace of uh, transformation within the neighborhood, uh, but also the lack of uh, awareness that residents are provided uh, about how the change is coming down and how they themselves can get involved. So I actually echo Shelley's concern. Uh, there's very little uh, residential engagement in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, and what ends up happening is we feel as residents that the change is happening to us and that we absolutely have no control and no say. Generally when we find out where we do have say and do have a little bit of control, it's already too late. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot uh, on the ground as a resident. I would say many of us uh, and why I got engaged is we, we just really were um, frustrated uh, at feeling helpless 
and so took it on ourselves uh, to investigate more and to really kind of stand up for what we believe our neighborhood and our community stands for. Uh, we have had a lot of uh, dealings with the Committee of Adjustment um, and a lot of uh, sort of interpretation as to uh, what we would, we would like to see in terms of change. Um, I'm not sure if you want to sort of wait for, to converse a little bit more about that later, but uh, that is the reason why we got involved. There was too much, too big, too fast, yeah. uh, and absolutely no engagement and no inclusion. Well, we, let's, let's cycle back to that, but uh, Janet, you, you can contribute to this sense of the problem because in, in the eastern, southeastern part of town where, where your residents are, um, you've gone through a huge and continuing uh, wave of this. I don't know that it's every, st I mean, uh, it's not quite every street right now, yeah. but there's still quite a lot of it and it causes a lot of, uh, now your group has responded somewhat differently. As I understand it, you've got an observer at every committee of adjustment meeting, is that right? So um, I, I give credit to the Trafalgar Chartwell Maple Grove uh, and, and yeah, Trafalgar Chartwell Residents Association because they led a real campaign to get planning and the Committee of Adjustment uh, more aware of residential concerns about um, what, what some people would like to call minor variances. Um, we see the tsunami coming our way. We anticipated it over the last year or two. And now we have an observer at um, as many as we can, though we're a volunteer organization. Um, and our, um, one of our directors regularly um, reads the applications. Uh, historically, m massive issues around how the Committee of Adjustment determined what was minor um, and, and a lack of I'll call it respect for stable residential neighborhoods. Um, I would tell you in the last 12 weeks, there has been a tremendous change in the language and the approach, um, and it bodes well um, for future applications um, not being granted um, at a whim. Yeah. Yeah, the staff, <coughs> I mean, to summarize, Council wrote a new official plan. Uh, uh, Linda's point about uh, being surprised and everything and it's too late uh, is, uh, is uh, very much a true thing because you, you have to, your official plan sets the top layer of rules, the zoning then has to conform to that and then the committee of adjustment if we, if we decide to have one is then supposed to interpret that for uh, after we, and we just finished, so we did the official, the new official plan, Livable Oakville in 2010, then we spent three years doing the new zoning bylaw, and, uh, and, and we're now, we have a new planning director who I think gets Oakville better than previously, okay. and he has done a good job of training the staff uh, to remember that the official plan includes section 11, mm -hmm. the section that says we're going to preserve and protect our established neighborhoods. But in the course of, the, of many of the cases that, it, that have come up to uh, the notice of um, my office, it has appeared to me that we need to uh, tighten the um, official plans permissions that it gives broad areas called neighborhoods or communities. So for example, uh, we've got these bungalow communities where, for a long, I mean, forever, as far as long as far as I as far as I know, forever they've had permission to have a second story, um, and um, and that adds some value to their lot. And uh, but if you're living a neighbor, on a street of bungalows and somebody builds a two-story house that sticks out and and your neighborhood starts to be transforming, and not in a way that that council was anticipating or that you might want. Uh, and at the same time, forever, we've uh, allowed people to build more on the lot than, than they have built. Um, and one of the most impactful ways that we see change in that uh, area is how far apart the houses are. They're, when you're, they're built wider apart than they, than they could be, and someone maximizes that lot coverage, all of a sudden the, the air in the community seems to go out of the out of the street and you're feeling crowded in. Uh, and the feedback I'm getting is that uh, people are not sure they really want to give up their second story rights, but they are pretty sure that they want to protect the air, bet the, the sense of space between homes. And, the, and is that what you're seeing as well? Or is there a, a desire to also cap bungalow neighborhoods at bungalow levels? Linda? 
Um, I would say th you've just described my neighborhood exactly, um, and uh, in all the research that we have done at this to this point is uh, exactly what you have described. So the the homes that are currently in existence in the neighborhood. Uh, have not been built to the full extent of what is allowed by the plan and by the bylaws. So in understanding that though, um, Section 11 really does speak to character of a neighbourhood. Uh, our main concerns are, yes, the, um, the, the homes right now are small homes. They generally take up approximately 30% of the lot size. Mm -hmm. uh, the homes coming in are taking up anywhere between 40 and sometimes 50% of mm -hmm. the lot size. And in doing that as well, one of the main characteristics not only is, is that sort of lot to uh, house ratio, uh, but it's also the trees, the mature trees. So people, um, new people coming to our neighborhood say, oh, we just love, this is such a desirable neighborhood uh, because the trees are so beautiful. And, and then they cut them down. And then they cut them all down yeah. and they build a big mansion. So what they're talking about, why they're buying into the neighborhood is, is, is your exactly trees. for my <laughs> trees and my house. But they're getting rid of, And then yeah. they, they clear cut and build a faux chateau and it ends up, uh, it's really what's happening now because of the pace and because of the volume of uh, these new builds. Yeah, so I, I was so no concerned about that. this. Yeah. I went to the Committee of Adjustment. I, I, I don't think I've ever gone, yeah. you know, uh, I, my, all my training was that the mayor shouldn't go uh, to speak to the Committee of Adjustment. Mm -hmm. Council appoints them and then can't touch them and they're supposed to be independent. Mm -hmm. But it got so bad on the tree loss side, I, I went uh, about four weeks ago and I said, Look, the council only intends minor variances in the true sense of minor impact, mm -hmm. and we never intended, because a lot of the tests go to the intent and purpose of the official plan and the zoning bylaws. So let me clear up what council's intention was. We never intended that by permitting a variance we were going to lose a tree. Mm -hmm. the, the goal is to save the tree, not to allow you to expand. Uh, but let's narrow in on the character uh, question because if you build within the, uh, the, the zoning and the official plan today, you can keep the trees and go two story, but that will transform the neighborhood from single to double. And, um, uh, and if you're not looking for extra lot coverage, then we don't have the ability to invoke section 11 uh, to make you save the tree or, or nip or tuck or change, right? And so this year as we're going through the official plan, the, the, the most important question I need answered from the public is, uh, you know, do you want us to tighten the official plan to save more trees, restrict the ability to, of people to build fake chateau, fake mansions, uh, and 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 I'm really reaching out as widely as I can everywhere because we we don't want to get this one wrong. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to jump in because we just had a recent application and um, to the credit of the neighborhood they reached out to uh, a former planner, uh, John Canham, who gave them some advice as well as JCRA and they launched a really good campaign to stop at the Committee of Adjustment um, a very large home and it happened to be the night you actually spoke um, and they turned down the application so um, our, our kudos to the Committee of Adjustment because they listened. Um, the key for us is that um, it's not the second story um, but front lot, um, back uh, setback, side lot setback um, and trees really do, um, it, that has a fundamental shift in terms of the character of the neighborhood. Um, the erosion of that front yard um, is significant. The height um, is, is, is tremendous because it affects shadows and people have to look up and over. So it's not about we don't want people to develop and we don't um, respect that there is change that's going to come. We need you to make sure, um, and if it has to go through tightening the official plan, that when we say there's a side lot setback rule, that it's respected. Um, it's not the starting point that, to which now we negotiate, okay, well, you can get three more feet or four more feet or five more feet, um, because it's that that's causing the erosion of the character of the neighborhood. Well, um, we can stop that, 
by killing the Committee of Adjustment. You did, no one has a right to a variance, minor or any others. You have a right to make an application for a zoning bylaw amendment, which is a really, that's a big thing and it costs a lot of money. Uh, and, it, and it starts to call into question you know, the protection against a zoning bylaw amendment that's wrong is if the official plan says the right thing about what the neighborhood's supposed to be. So this year, no matter how you slice or dice all these points, this year when we're doing the livable Oakville five-year review, this is the most crucial time because when you, you get the top-level rule, you're, you are entitled to apply for a zoning bylaw amendment up to what's given by the official plan. So where there's a gap between the official plan and the zoning bylaw, we're in jeopardy for that gap. This is the year when we bring the official plan down to where the zoning is, if that's what we want. Or anyway, everything's everything is supposed to be open. Raise it up, down, leave it the same. But but to the exact point of do we want to like height, for example. Uh, these adjustments that the committee gives on height have really bothered council. Um, uh, the adjustments they've given on lot coverage are bothering council, and especially this narrowing of the gap between the homes. And and um, we're we're at the I would say we're at the point on council where we're about this far away from just abolishing the the committee on the grounds that you know we're not looking for. We don't want to see these 0.9 meter minor variances in height. I mean, 0.9 meters. It's. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that's, uh, as for talking purposes, that's a good three feet higher than anybody mm -hmm. else's house. Yeah. And I don't feel that's minor. Yeah. Well, and I I would like to echo and support what you're saying is that we're not opposed to development. I think development is really important for Oakville and and uh, in particular in my neighborhood where some of the homes really are in need of being demolished and rebuilt. Um, but I think the key word that you said really is impact. And I think what we're seeing in our neighborhood is there are shadowing impacts. Uh, there are privacy impacts. There's quality of life impact as well. And I'll just give a personal example. The home next to me now is a faux chateau. Uh, they chose to put their um, air conditioner, which is an air conditioner for 3,600 square feet, uh, right underneath my um, master bedroom window. Oh my God. So I no longer can sleep in my master bedroom window. I have had to move my bedroom to the other side of the house. Is that fair? No. If these are the types of things that need to be addressed, and it may sound menial, but when you put all of that together, you put privacy issues together with um, noise issues, where things are placed around the around the lot line, uh, shadowing. You put all of those together, and you no longer have the character of the neighborhood, and you have residents who cannot actually transition. So I wouldn't the change is too much for us. If, to, if anybody's to wondering yeah. what, what the definition of a minor impact is, there I would go. say when you when you're forcing somebody to give up using their bedroom, you've you've passed way beyond minor. And but for me it's too late. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't have a choice now. And I'd love, you know, I'd like to negotiate with my neighbors, but it's not their fault because it was the the builders who did that. So we are in this, uh, we're also in a, in a position where the people coming in, and, and I think you were describing this earlier as well, people coming in are, are builders. They're not the actual residents. And they so widened, right? Next they, door Oh, you? they widened. They went deeper. Uh, they have a, a raised porch, which now looks across all of the neighbors' backyards. They also then clear cut their entire lot. So there's not even a tree to support privacy or to maintain any of the, the character of the neighborhood. So it's, uh, you know, I'm now planting more trees on my lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's another why home. Does this, why does this happen? Why, why does this get to the point where now nothing can be done and I am immensely impacted as well as my neighbors surrounding me? But doesn't this no. talk to the fact that we really need to um, look at our public notification and review process because when you dial in more public input, so between sure. neighbors, um, within if, if it's been minor or the the variance or the consent applications or even site applications for that matter, you have you support a process where you have this input and you can put the ideas on the table and hopefully negotiate to a better point. No, the, so I don't the, know. Does abolishing a, the committee does it help no, a, that? No, there's a, yes because the, see the real problem. Notice isn't the real issue here. The permissions that are inherent in the official plan and the zoning, uh, you can have all the notice in the world and make any argument you want, but if the official plan and the zoning give yeah. them the right, right to, to do, do it, that. 
your ideas are uh, not going to be listened to. You have no, you have actually have no space to negotiate in, well, because I, you don't. We don't have any. You or the town don't have anything to negotiate over, given that they've already been granted the rights. And that's why. Um, I mean, uh, Councillor Duddick uh, led um, uh, a huge effort uh, four years ago to change public notice, and and it's been. I mean, it. I think it's pretty good now, but it, whether it's good now or not, it's it's radically better than it was before uh, four years ago. It's it's the actual uh, space you have to negotiate. What are the rules and? And if we achieve any, if we don't achieve anything else today, for people who watch our, our conversation, let, I hope that we spread the word that now's the time to come forward and tell your counselors and tell council that you know uh, what you want. Janet and Linda have put together a, a very concise statement about you know the lot coverage and the separations and the heights, mm -hmm. and not necessarily the uh, second story and the protection of trees. And, I, and Linda's story illustrates another thing, which is we've got a, we don't have, but we, sh we, we should uh, develop rules about where you can put your mechanicals that cause noise. Mm -hmm. Because you shouldn't be able to, you know, ruin your neighbor's bedroom. So, uh, I, so I, 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 <laughs> we, the, the point of the work we're doing is to give you something to be able to negotiate, because right now you, you don't have any Well, I think the public um, notification comes in, in both that process and the application process, because you're, you're going to be hopefully seeking public input as you are with the Huber regulation. So it's seeking the public input as to how much do we close the gap between the official plan, because um, you're not going to be able to consider every sort of um, development that will be out there, especially when we're talking about stable um, residential areas. The other thing is that it, the public input actually helps the process as it stands on the ground, because we all know that change is the only thing that really is constant. And there may be some valid reasons to some of the applications, but that said, we need to have the conversation, the process to, to, to validate those applications. Right. So can I just jump in on all that? We're, all we're saying is that unless you have rules to negotiate from, you'll be you'll be talking, it'll be a one-sided conversation. The, the builder will be able to ignore us. So now's the time to, you know, enhance our ability to negotiate, let's let's put it that way. And, so, and wherever there's an opportunity to improve public notice, council will support that, Jen. So two things, one is, uh, so public notification, so uh, in the last, uh, I think it's three months, um, and it's all, it, it's an improvement, but it's not where it needs to be. I, I know where um, I'm going with this, we, yeah. we, You know, you got one weekend as a resident yeah. um, that was within um, a certain amount of feet of a property that was being developed. You got one weekend's notice mm -hmm. to basically gather the troops and, and mm -hmm. go and, and, and uh, talk to the Committee of Adjustment. You now have two weekends. Still not probably enough, but I understand there's some Planning Act um, restrictions that, that, that need to be adjusted as well at the provincial level. Um, what I think is important that I'm hearing is this education, and we've we've really felt that at JCRA, um, we're appreciative. The town has now created a committee of adjustment um, brochure that tries to explain the process a bit more. We have uh, published um, John Canham's, uh, he's a uh, former director of TCRA, his guide to the committee of adjustment. People don't understand that process, I would agree. and yeah. if you eliminate yes. it, well, I guess all of that's for naught. Yeah. And maybe eliminating it is something that needs to be widely debated. But more importantly, people really aren't informed, and it's hard to reach people in this crazy, busy life we have. Yeah. We'll help try to get that out there, but broader public consultation, we're all we're all for it yeah. because people do need to feel that they have a sense of control over the pace of the change and what the change is. And in zone is an example where we actively went and talked about floor lot ratio. And we were assured by the former planner, um, senior planner, that that this was going to protect us from monster homes. And in fact, it wasn't tight enough. So I applaud that you are leading now this uh, effort to perhaps tighten that official plan so people can still develop consistent with the area in which they live in because each neighborhood has some uniquenesses um, but we also have to make sure people really truly are informed because I mean those of us that are engaged um, and have, can find those moments to be engaged 
we understand it, but we got to get more people engaged. Well, I'll just speak from my experience because I don't have the experience that either of you have, and I consider myself to be a fairly educated person and a fairly resourceful person, and it took me months to figure out the process, to navigate the process, to understand, in fact, the transparency of the OMB is a whole other issue oh. that needs to be oh, uh, needs yeah. to be addressed. Would love to be back on that panel. Um, Sign the petition. Sign the petition. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm in agreement. We do need to tighten those reins. We need to make it absolutely clear as to uh, what we as residents and what we as a town uh, think is responsible and appropriate development. So again, it's not about non-development, but but we need to define that. And then I'm in agreement with getting rid of the, the Committee of Adjustment. If we define that, what are we doing? We're just then setting gray lines. We're confusing neighbors. Mm -hmm. We're putting the, er, the onus on neighbors, on people who are taxpayers, who really, in my opinion, it's really up to the town, mm -hmm. up to our councillors who we elect. It's up, to, it's up to them to support us and to hear us and then to execute on what our needs are. And I, I think that there's a disconnect there. This whole process as a system is broken. Mm -hmm. Committee of Adjustment gone clarify, get, get Section 11 in the Eofield Plan black and white um, so that builders are clearer themselves and they know what they can build within and so that can be communicated back to the community so we know what to expect. There's your change management plan. Well, really, and, and there's a... And no fee. And, and no, no fee. And no fee. And no, fee. <laughs> there there's a, and no time. You yeah, know, and, no, and you don't no even... Extra time. And you don't have to, to worry. The, uh, you know, I've heard... if I've the, the thing I've heard the most often about applications for minor variances is why can't they build within the generous allotment that's already there, there in the zoning? Exactly. Here, exactly. <laughs> yes. here. Hear. Agreed. All right. Agreed. Um, on the OMB, it's timely, uh, so let's just branch out a tiny bit from the OMB. 75% of what the OMB does is Committee of Adjustment cases. Um, uh, the province is very, f and, and the, the 29 mayors and chairs of the GTAH have uh, put in a list of very specific um, OMB reforms that we want. The, uh, one of the government officials two weeks ago uh, or three weeks ago now, uh, came out and said, these 40 communities that have passed uh, resolutions asking for reform of the OMB are being too general and they don't know what they're talking about and the problem is that they have bad planning and, and we don't need to change the OMB, we need to change you. And, uh, and so it's been very hard for the 29 mayors and chairs of the GTAH to kind of uh, let that go by because he knows very well, because we gave it to him, that we've given them very specific changes that we want. But I want to branch to this one point, and we're running out of time, too. Um, what the province has always said is, you need the OMB because the courts are longer and more expensive and, and less um, respectful of the public. And in my view, what's happened is the courts have reformed and the board has not, and the courts are now faster, cheaper, and way more respectful. And, uh, and it's time for everybody to raise their voice for OMB reform. And we will be going out with a big campaign on that in the next few months as well. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining in today. And I hope that everyone will start talking about the need to, uh, what are we going to do about the Committee of Adjustment and what are we going to do about the Ontario Municipal Board. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time on Oakville Matters.